I'm Mark Unger, producer of Roundtable. Because we find this presentation so special, we really would like for you to see this. Please watch. Good evening. Welcome to Single Shot at Manhattan uh, Neighborhood Networks Roundtable. We continue our conversation with Hank O'Neill. Last uh, in last episode, we was talking about uh, transformation from uh, a photographer to a phenomenon in photography, and uh, this time we wanted to focus more about correlation between what photography does and society and technology specifically. Hello, Hank, again, and thank you for continuing. Good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, uh, last time you mentioned that uh, there was two photographers who were suggesting their tools of choice to you. One of them was Abbott, and uh, the other person who was suggesting Rollerflex, as I understood, actually did it because you was suggested the medium format is the one to use, and he wanted to prove it uh, not being so. He wanted you to try something different and see for yourself which one working better for you. Well, the, I, I really enjoyed working with a, uh, a, a Rolleiflex camera, and as a matter of fact, um, because I did, um, and the the pictures that I took with the the, the Rolleiflex were mostly for two things. One was for record covers because of the square format. The other thing that I used the Rolleiflex for was um, working outdoors in Maine um, with, with Bernice Abbott. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of using a big camera, I would use a medium format camera. I mean, if you had to march across a trestle for two miles or something like that. It's much easier to carry a Rolleiflex than a big Deerdorf. Anyway, but um, I used the, 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 the Rolleiflex for the record covers, and beginning probably about 1974 or five, um, when I started making many records, um, and I was having to do most of the work myself, in other words, be an engineer, be a photographer, find the money to pay the musicians, and all these different things. Um, I became concerned because you were supposed to list credits on the back of a record uh -huh. produced by the engineer and so forth. Um, so for the photographer credit, it never said Hank O'Neill. Why not? Uh, because I didn't want my name to appear too many times. Oh. It appeared once, and that was enough. Um, so for the photography credit, if I took the pictures, it said Rolo Flex. That was my name. And if you go into Google today and you put in Rolo Flex, which is a totally just made up silly name Indeed. from the camera, um, there are a whole bunch of hits because the people who list old records put in all the details and all this, and you can get a whole list on Google of the record covers or the pictures on records that were taken by Rolo Flex. And oh, so you <laughs> manufactured the completely fictional photographer. So, exactly. This is really good. And so, uh, but uh, I, I like that camera very, very much, and finally, uh, as I said, the, my first Rolo Flex uh, had been given to me by Bert Stern. Uh -huh. Bert had about nine or ten. Uh, he had a, a, a silver uh, case that had eight or nine, two eight rollies in it, and um, so I kept that. I used it for a long, long time, and then in the I don't remember exactly when it happened. Sometime in the eighties, but Rolleiflex uh, made another camera that was an electronic one. Uh -huh. Electronic in so forth it, that it had a meter that had a little green light in it that you uh -huh. could, and I, I remember I, uh, a friend had given me a, a rare 
Leica. Uh, and I don't care about whether they're rare or not. So I traded that rare Leica for a electronic roll of flex, which I still haven't used. I gave away the um, the Roloflex that Bert Stern had given me, I gave it to his son, who mm -hmm. is now, he's not a photographer, he's a, in, he makes television commercials and things like that. But it, it just sort of made sense that it, keep it in the family more or less. Because it's all that was left of all of Bert's cameras. They all were yeah. dissipated and things. Wow. So, uh, but it's a, it's a marvelous, uh, a marvelous camera. Um, and one of my favorite pictures um, is I took the electronic Roloflex to Maine one summer and Bernice went out and uh, she wanted to go take a ride in a boat on her lake and so by this time she is 88, 89, yeah. something like that and I have uh, a Leica and she is holding my Roloflex, and she has taken a picture of me with the Roloflex, and I've taken a picture of her with the Leica, and I printed it together. I'm on one side and she's on the other. And what's, what is remarkable about the picture is not that, you know, it's in focus, but the fact that at the age of 88, in a boat going like this on Lake Hebron, she could still <laughs> get it in focus and not, and, and it's sharp and, and you know, and she's 88. Was it and the boat is going like this. Was it a familiar camera for her? Did she use it before? Oh, it was yeah. the first time. Bernice uh, used a Roloflex a lot for her uh -huh. uh, Greenwich Village photographs. And uh, as a matter of fact, I bought her um, a Tele Roly. Mm -hmm. and the wide-angle Roly that uh -huh. she had when she died. Oh, I always like They're this. wonderful cameras. Yeah, I always like this uh, exercise for myself, and maybe I can ask it in the form of question to you as well. If uh, there would be a situation when from the world all the cameras have to disappear and there would be just one film camera that would be left and that's it, nothing else, and you are the one to decide, which camera would it be? Well, probably the... The, the one that I took the most pictures with, and, and I'm not saying it's the best one, but it's the, the one that I, I was just a, a Nikon 35 millimeter camera because it was, yeah. it was flexible. I could do so many different things with it. Whereas the, the Roloflex, which I love dearly, but I used for very specific things uh, I mean, it wasn't necessarily the best camera in the world to go out and shoot on the street or, 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 or things like that. So, yeah. um, uh, but that, that's sort of hard. That's like saying, you know, what's your, your favorite record or, or something like that. Your favorite camera is the one that will do the job that you have to do. No, that's for sure. I'm an and, equipment buff myself. And, uh, and, and so, and, and they all have different, different uh, capabilities. And so, mm -hmm. and I mean, now that uh, it's all digital, um, I, I'm not a, I, I'm not somebody who, who feels you have to have 37 cameras to, to make it work or 100 lenses. I mean, 95% of the photographs that I have taken in the last 10 years are with one camera or one camera at a time. I mean, I've sort of upgraded yeah. from the first digital camera that I had, uh -huh. but not really into silly kind of stuff. I mean, the, it's, uh, I, I was out taking photographs with a friend not too long ago who had just acquired um, a really fancy, expensive Leica digital camera. And she was having fits just making it work. I mean, things that, you know, things were messing up because, you know, scenes were going away because she couldn't make it work fast enough. You uh, want to make it, you don't want to have something that's so complicated that, uh, and that, that's, as I, as I said earlier, I'm not that technical.
Uh, you have to just be able to see. I mean, I'll give you a story. About a year ago, I was um, out in the Lower East Side, and um, I was walking on Bleecker Street, and purely by accident, it turned out that Robert Frank and his, his wife June, June Leaf, were sitting in front of their building. And I walked up, hi Robert, how you doing, blah, 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 we talked for a while. And I'll never forget, um, after we had talked for about 15 minutes, I said, well Robert, I've got to go do this or that. And I said, let me take a snapshot, and they held still, and I took a couple of pictures. and. The last thing he said to me, now I just had a perfectly ordinary Canon digital camera, you know, a, a T3i, mm -hmm. which is an inexpensive, you know, low-end kind yeah. of camera, and um, but takes really good pictures. You, mm -hmm. If you have right. something to take a picture of, and taking a picture of Robert in front of his house is something to take a picture of. But his comment was, why are you carrying around that heavy old camera? <laughs> Um, and it made me think back to Bernice saying uh, at that SX-70 that I had, uh -huh. that's a toy, uh -huh. because she was used to a great big view oh, camera. Perspective and I said, Walker Evans is using this. And she said, you tell Walker not to play with toys. <laughs> and the point was, though, the reason he was doing that and he was a good pal of Robert Frank's uh -huh. in the early days, was that uh, Walker Evans, at the age of 73, that was about all he could carry. He did. It, he could carry an SX-70, because uh -huh. it was light enough. And, uh, I mean, different people have different capabilities when they're 73, and he, was, he would sort of run out of gas. But... Um, and in, in any event, all the cameras have a different different function, and uh, I still have my SX70, and that those, those those wonderful people who 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 are making the film that's called the Impossible Project or something like that, oh, yeah, you can awesome. actually get film for it now, which is nice. Yeah, so. actually, I actually uh, bought one uh, at some point to try to shoot Polaroid. Uh huh. Because thing is, I was growing uh, in uh, Soviet country and it kind of missed this uh, moment. Uh -huh. It was film cameras and right away it was digital. There was really? no Polaroid. No, no it was just a fancy <laughs> toy for a small uh, se yeah. uh, for a split second. Yeah. It, it's indeed an interesting situation, an interesting process. It's the the, the original SX-70 film that I would have taken in 1972 or something like that, huh? if you didn't abuse the pictures, that is, throw them around and put it, but if you kept them carefully in an envelope or something like that, the color is just as good today as it was the day you took it. Really? It's amazing how the color has held. The color holds as well as Kodachrome, and um, I mean, I have Kodachromes that my father took in 1942. Mm -hmm. that I, I used in the book that I just had come out that are absolutely gorgeous. They're still... Uh, we're talking about negatives or we're talking about... Prints? Kodachromes. The Chromes. Oh, the Transparencies. Okay. Oh, yeah, I guess you. And um, the, 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 the color is still absolutely beautiful. Okay. And the color on... I mean, I have a portrait I did of Walker Evans huh? with that SX-70, and it still looks just as good today as it did then. And um, so, anyway. Well, it's actually, uh, if we would be continuing talking about equipment, we probably will need 10 more episodes for that. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to ask you in connection with technology, I mean, uh, recently, it's uh, the way photography is perceived is completely different because, uh, for one, it's very much affordable. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier to get a decent quality digital camera. It uh, costs you virtually nothing when it comes to producing an extra uh, shot. When he was photographing with film, 
every roll exactly. costs X amount of money, and there are only maximum 36 uh, exposures in mm -hmm. it. Now you can make 1,000 and it wouldn't cost you a dime. That's right. And uh, on top of that, then you have uh, the uh, reproduction costs, the costs of uh, developing uh, film. So it was completely different setup from that perspective, but in many other ways, it was, it's became much more accessible. For God's sake, there are a lot of people who are making photos with their cell phones and having it in a gallery printed on a large format uh, prints. So, and some uh, of them are very good. Oh, some of them definitely are. Well, cell phones are still not there. It really takes a very good lighting mm -hmm. to make a decent cell phone picture, but uh, it's already a miracle if you <laughs> think about That's it. That's right. It certainly is. So uh, what I think is a change of the way photography is perceived by the society uh, because of the change in the technology. I know that at one point he was photographing some very prominent people and uh, photographer was a phenomenon on itself. A person with a camera was seen as something completely different in my understanding. Here, here's an example uh, that you might find interesting. In 1977, mm -hmm. I made a record with a marvelous vocalist whose name is Joan LaBarbera. Mm -hmm. It's not a jazz record, it is modern music. Um, uh, to put it in perspective, one of the pieces on Joan's record was written by John Cage, who mm -hmm. was a very avant-garde. Um, in any event, uh, and much of the music on that record was done with synthesizers uh, in 1977, early synthesizers, and, uh, and tape, recording tape, mm -hmm. you know, that you would overdub and do lots of things uh -huh. with. And we decided we were going to call this the record Tape Songs. And so to create a cover for that, I took maybe 50 or 60 big reels of half-inch recording tape mm -hmm. and hung them from the ceiling in my studio and let the tape spin off onto the floor until I had a pile of t recording tape that was wider than this table and that high. I asked Joan to come to the studio wearing a leotard, mm -hmm. um, and we dressed her in the tape. The only thing you can see of her is her head, and it falls down like a dress. And that was the cover of the record. Oh, and uh, it was very, very well received. It was put on the front of various books about interesting record covers from the 70s and things like that. Um, I took one roll a film with my Roloflex, three or four, and that was in color, three or four, maybe four, because I would have used two film holders, um, four by five with the Deerdorf in black and white, and a handful, like less than a roll, of 35 millimeter. Uh -huh. That's all. Um, about Four or five months ago, I was contacted by a poetry festival in Madrid who wanted to use my photograph of Joan for a poster that they were going to do to advertise their festival. And I said, by all means, because Joan was going to appear at it and it was... And then about a month later, they contacted me again and said, um, would you consider doing the photo again 40 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, sure. First, I had to find the tape. Nobody uses recording tape anymore very much. Mm -hmm. I found about 25 or 30 ro rolls that I could spool off onto the floor. Mm -hmm. um, Joan was game to do it. I did it downstairs in a uh, photo studio on the floor below me. Um, the original photographs of 12 two and a quarter color transparencies under a single skylight, and that's all, a 12 foot by 12 foot skylight. This time there were a half a dozen lights that were strobes that were all cut. I was not watch. I was watching through my digital camera one with one eye, 
and a big computer screen that was showing me what I was taking. I had no idea what I was getting in 1977. Yeah. Here I saw it in real time as it was going on, and I probably took five or 600 pictures and got one that I liked. Oh, but the first time, process. but that's the difference. Yeah. The first time uh, I took 12 and got one I really liked. This time I took maybe 500 and got, th there were 20 or 30 or 40 that would have been perfectly fine. And there was one that was just, her hand was just right and her face was just right and the tape was falling just right. Uh, but that's the difference. Mm -hmm. And I was watching that screen in real time, knew exactly what I had. 40 years earlier, I had to take my roll of film to the uh, film processing place, wait for three or four days to see whether I had anything that was any good. Fortunately, most of the time, I can't think of any time that I ever took record cover photos that nothing came out properly, but it always, you always had something. But oh, it's, it's, that's the difference with today. And I mean, I told you that I used that Roloflex camera to take pictures when I was in Maine, color pictures that I, I thought were interesting. Well, the the technology today, most of that, those those pictures were not taken on Kodachrome transparencies, they were taken on Kodacolor film. Mm -hmm. And those negatives over the years have shifted. But I can scan those negatives, I have scanned those negatives, and they have been fixed so the color has been restored and it's all perfect and wonderful and, oh, and things like that. Definitely. And it can turn into a book project or whatever. And that's the difference. And uh, right. you utilize technology to uh, to create pictures or to save pictures or to do whatever you need to do. And so how do you think uh, this uh, tremendous change and increase of in the amount of available tools change in the perspective of a photographer? For you? Well, I think it changes it from the standpoint that um, a lot of people think that they're photographers. And just because you have a camera, a really good camera even, uh, and just because you have a really good computer and you can play a little bit with Photoshop and you're good at that kind of thing, um, if you don't see the right kind of things, <laughs> I mean, if you're taking pictures of the backyard barbecue or your babies or, or whatever, mm -hmm. maybe they'll be better but um, than they would have been with a Brownie Hawkeye, but at the same time, just because you can go click on a camera does not mean that you're a photographer. Oh, there has to sure. be some sort of intellectual basis and uh, or a concept in your head of what you want to do. Um, just because the picture turns up on your iPhone, I mean, I have a friend, a, a young friend who um, is is a real expert in photography. I mean, she, and she decided that she wants to take pictures herself. And she's scholarly trained history of photography and things like that. But she went out and got herself a Roloflex okay. and is taking it on film and she's getting good and, mm -hmm. and it's terrific. On the other hand, I have another friend who's about the same age and she is taking photographs almost totally digitally um, and creating almost all of these photographs in her one room apartment in London. And they're spectacular. I mean, spectacular enough that the, the Tate picked out eight of her pictures and put them in a show in, in Arles this year. And she's a young, young girl. Um, so, but that's because it's working up here and it's working here and it's not, and the interesting thing is she um, is now doing pictures with film and had done totally digits. said, oh, look what I can do by layering film together and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's all in your head and, and, and the concept and whether or not you can see the, and, and know how to adequately utilize the marvelous tools that all of these engineers who are 120 times smarter than you and I have managed to create uh, mm -hmm. for us to play with. Well, some believe that it actually has a downside, that uh, the increased accessibility of photography actually devalued uh, it 
in terms of its artistic value, people don't see it as an art as much as they used to. You, you're absolutely right. I mean, I have an iPhone. I have a friend who made a feature film on an iPhone. The recording capability on that iPhone, if I had had that phone in 1969, um, I would be jealous. <laughs> yeah, I could have done things that were better and more interesting than what I was doing in a recording studio. That's and cool, yeah. what it has done, and you're absolutely right, it has made things too easy. It's too. You have no idea how hard it was to make an LP in 1970. Have With the recording studio and the musicians and finding a way to pay for it and to manufacture metal lack a metal pressing plant and all that kind of stuff it was incredible. It's so easy now you can make it in your bedroom, oh, and now, and unfortunately a lot of people do. Well, now and marketing most is a problem. Most of it is not so good. Well, that's everybody can write something but that doesn't make them a writer indeed so well uh, yeah hopefully our society will find a way to oh it, it'll get weeded out i it'll definitely believe it will uh, i mean one other way we will find an understanding of what mm -hmm. is art and what is not and where we have to That's go right. for that i personally believe that uh, the way for photography right now is to abstract from uh, trying to copy the reality but try to create its own reality using all those tools that's actually right. make the same move painting made at some point that's right yeah, so let's hope we'll see some new and exciting stuff well, get, and get busy and and do that and then we'll have another talk about it well definitely and uh, i'm looking forward so, to see this pleasure. book you mentioned it was, it was great. a pleasure and an honor thank you very much <laughs> thank Frank. you alex it was wonderful <laughs>